Hello again there folks, Lone Adventurer here. Thank you very much for stumbling your way upon my channel and choosing to spend your time with me on this adventure. This is part two of my new playthrough of 2D6 Dungeon. This is my second playthrough. If you haven't seen part one, there'll be a link up in the corner of the screen right about now. And if you're not familiar with this game and you would like to see uh, a slightly more detailed look at how it works, I would recommend watching my original playthrough and there'll be a link to part one of that down in the description below. So we need to get on our hero Bane just survived an encounter with an Ophelit, which was a moderately scary being, moderately scary, very scary, scariest I've seen so far in this game, an ancient giant of the old world. It had 32 HP and it took a lot of killing and Bane almost didn't make it, which would have been a little annoying for the video series, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Luckily, didn't happen. We defeated Ophelit, gained 210 XP, did some leveling up, which was pretty cool. Now we need to think about moving on from the urn room. I think I finished everything to do with the urn room. Let's say I did. However, Bane does only have 11 health points at the moment, which is not a lot. We do have a magic scroll of surging health, which I suppose we could use. That would allow us to gain 20 HP. Might be a good idea. I'm also wondering if we could use some of our herbs here make a healing thing of some kind. Actually, we could make a healing balm, I think, because that requires, I've done that, that's the one I've done before, and it requires maleco leaves and scarlet oreovatus. No, that's not right. Ilios petals. Maleco leaves and Ilios petals. And I think I've got both of those. Maleco leaves. I should probably have a separate section for my herbs and whatnot so I can find them more easily. Yeah, I don't have Ilios petals. I did have, but I'd use them already. I don't think there's anything else I can make. You can chew Maleco leaves. I'm assuming that's a health benefit. Chewed Maleco. Uh, it heals one HP. There's really no point in doing that. So I guess my only option would be to use the Surging Health Scroll, but that's not guaranteed and there could be side effects. We've got a few rooms here along the edge that we have not yet tried to discover and exit from the dungeon, so we could do that now. What I'm gonna do is roll for each of these rooms. We can imagine we're just moving around the rooms. Bane is just moving around the rooms that he's already cleared and having a look to see if there's an exit. And for each room, we roll a d6. And if we roll a six, we have found an exit back to the surface and we can go back to the village. So we'll start with the urn room that we've just cleared. Nope. Gonna put a little x if the uh, room hasn't got an exit, because you can only check each one once. Then this room here, Nope. Then room two, which was the paper, which was the marble temple. No, I mean, what are the chances of me rolling a six when I need to? And the paper nests room, what do you know? So we've got an exit. That's pretty good news. Fantastic. I really didn't think that was gonna work out then. That's good because on video, I have never shown you the town. In fact, I've only been into town once. I think on uh, level three, I found an exit here. I checked this room, I checked this room, I checked this room, I found an exit here. And level two, it looks like I wasn't marking the rooms I had checked. Maybe I was feeling quite confident and I didn't uh, check. Okay, right, let's 
just remind myself, I think you can I think you just mark the exit. So we've got an exit here and the deal is that's it. That's the only exit unless something else happens to suggest otherwise. That's the only exit from this level. So we can only do it once. So if we turn to the leaving the dungeon section, if you leave and return to town, you can heal up to full health points. Now I've had a look and I can't see any mention of a mechanic that allows you to heal. So I think it's just an automatic thing. You go back to town, that allows you to rest and it allows you to heal your wounds. So I think it's an automatic thing. If it isn't, I apologise. Someone will have to point it out to me. But I'm going to say that means I get to heal up to full health, which is up to 40, which is the maximum for level 4. So this is the first time I've been up to that much health. Now we've got no prisoners that we need to liberate. We've got a bunch of places around town. We've got the market where we could sell and buy items. I don't think I've got much that I want to sell. So what do I want to buy? It says refer to the tables codex for items available. I might want to sell my treasures. Right, so looking here, I can see some of the item tables have a cost column. So presumably those are the things that we can buy. We've got some armor there. All the costs are in gold. I'm not sure what the conversion of silver to gold is. I might have to have a look for that. We've got some magic potions that have a cost. There's some pretty cool magic potions. Could get a strength potion, plus one damage per hit for one whole combat. Speed blast, that's pretty good. That's 13 gold coins, plus two free attacks at the start of one combat. That could be helpful. Healing, heal up to 10 health points. 18 gold, quite expensive. And the gain health... Gain 15 health points, it can exceed base level. That's 25 gold. They're not, they're not cheap. We've also got some magic scrolls we could buy and some gems we could sell. Oh, decisions. I think basically I want to buy a couple of potions. Okay, so 10 silver equals 1 gold. So that is the equivalent of 11 additional gold. Right, so I think I'll go for, just uh, keep it simple, I'm not going to worry about converting my treasure right now. I'm just going to go for a couple of those potions. We're going to have the gain health, which allows you to gain 15 health points. And I might go for that speed blast as well. Right, so we went with the gain health and the speed blast. That cost me a total of 38 gold. Which seems like a lot, but as I've learnt, you can't put a price on staying alive. So that has taken us down to 32 gold, but we've got a couple of nice potions there. So we can also, uh, we can buy some rations. What's my ration situation? We've got two. You have to consume rations between each level. I don't know if you have to consume them at other times. That's fine. I think we will be all right without any additional rations for the time being. Now, you can go for some tavern exploits in the evening. I think uh, that can be good. It can be bad. I haven't looked too closely at what the options are. So we'll roll on the tavern exploits table and see if anything interesting happens. Five. Aha. Uh -huh. This is what happened to me last time. The tavern is very quiet this evening, but it does allow you to talk to Frieda tending bar. She talks about some of the characters who have been in lately, including one group talking about finding another entrance to the dungeon and a distinctive stone that marks the spot. When you enter the dungeon again, you may exit that level one additional time rather than pushing on to the next level before you can find another exit shaft. So I'll make a note of that. I think it means that you, you still have to roll to see whether you find that exit, but you can theoretically find an additional exit. 
All right, so after our tavern exploits, we can put some stuff in a lockup. You can swap our armor, particularly useful for larger items that can be damaged or destroyed while adventuring. Don't really have a lot of larger items yet. Now you can take part in a arm wrestling competition. Should we do that as well? You can also visit a temple. Located on a hill above the town is the Universal Temple. It is a place where all gods are welcome and you can meditate on their message, turning your attention to the subterranean gods and calling for their favour. So we can choose a god and gain a favour point for that god. Now I've got three favour points for Gracada. I've got one for Maduva and one for Nevazetor. So maybe we should look at one of those and have an increase of one of those, depending upon which one we think might be handy. Okay, if we're blessed by Maduva, we can no longer be poisoned or infected. I guess that's a permanent thing. That's pretty good. And Nevazator gives you a plus three bonus when rolling on a particular table. RFUT1. I don't know what that is, so I'm just going to have a look at it. RFUT1 is recovery from unconscious. So if you fall unconscious, you are more likely to be able to effectively recover if you've got Nevazator the Blind on your side. I might go for Maduva the Rot. At some point, we should try rolling on one of those gods and seeing if we can gain their favour. But not right now. What about the arm wrestling? While in town, you can also take part in a friendly arm wrestling competition held at the town hall. It could bolster your confidence and physical well-being before returning to the dungeon. Of course, if you lose, it may have the opposite effect. Roll 2d6 on the arm wrestle table. Add your discipline modifier. Any resulting modifiers are noted on the character sheet and taken into your next adventure. You can only arm wrestle once per visit to town. Oh, my discipline is quite high. I've got plus three because of that ring, which I still haven't remembered to write down. But let's give it a go, shall we? Oh, that's big. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen plus. You progress deep into the arm wrestling tournament and smash the final with a fine victory. You stand upon the table triumphant, fellow drunk revellers cheering your name. You have proven to yourself that you have a keen focus. Gain one discipline permanently. You can only do this once in the arm wrestling competition. If it happens again, gain 20 gold coins instead. Wow, I am super disciplined. So I'll pop something here under the additional notes. So I've written that we have gained plus one discipline in an arm wrestling competition, so I remember I can't do that again, but now we've got plus four discipline. Pretty big, pretty good. Right, with that done, we should probably head back to the dungeon and crack on with this exploration. Right, so let us carry on, shall we? We've only got three doors we can go through. One of them we already know is locked. So hopefully we'll get another room in here that allows us to move up in that direction. So let's see. Three, six. That's good. I like that. Now we're not going to have any exits on the side because we're too close to that uh, end of the area here. And actually, we're not going to have any exits on that side either. So we're only going to have a maximum of one exit in this room because I like to keep my dungeons neat and tidy. Or maybe that's the way it works anyway. How many exits? Two. So we have just got one exit. That's fine. And we've got a standard room here. So we'll turn to the level four room table. 62. A mosaic tomb. This space was once beautiful and features a large mosaic showing a battle scene. Kneeling at a large chest is a tomb raider. They turn and draw their cutlass. And then we'll roll on CT3. 
presumably once we've defeated the Tomb Raider, I think. Random doors, and this is a unique room. Just realise I'm not using my erasable pen again. So Tomb Raider, let's find the Tomb Raider. All right, so this is a level three uh, enemy. Gives us a slight sense of the level of difficulty they're going to be. 20 HP to uh, take down, 70 XP for defeating, a shift of one, some treasure. Interrupt, they do a low duck on primary fours and fives to avoid two damage. That could be an issue for our hue attack. And a forearm block on secondary ones and twos, and that could be an issue for our hack. So we do need to think about those. Couple of maneuvers, one on three, one, and one on three, six. There are a few people who dare to venture into the crypts in search of treasure. They are more than happy to recover the treasure from those who get in their way. They draw a knife and attack. So here we go, we've got a nice little combat. Not as scary as the previous one that we were involved in. Here we go, attacking first. Four, six, and I've got a shift of still a shift of two okay now we can shift that down to a four four allowing us to do our hue attack now our attack dice here being four four means that they will use the tomb raider will use their interrupt uh low duck on primary fours meaning that they will take two damage because they duck under our attack to some degree but we're doing d6 plus 4 damage this is our new uh, level 2 maneuver that we just gained oh look at that 6 uh, plus 4 7 8 9 10 minus 2 means we're doing 8 points of damage taking the tomb raider down to 18 then they're going to attack back 2 6 oh that is not going to allow the cutlass slash with the one shift, but unfortunately one shift means they can do their grip twist attack, which is D3 damage. So that is half of D6, so that is only one, one point of damage. That could have been a lot worse. Taking Bane down to 39. Then round two. One six, that does not sound good. I'm not gonna be able to do anything with that. That's a miss. And a six two from the Tomb Raider. That is a miss as well. They can't do anything with that. So two misses on to round three. Five six, that sounds bad to me. Yeah, I can't do anything with that. That's unfortunate. They attack back, five, four, sorry, four, five. Yep, nothing happening. So we're gonna go on to round four. Basically just a load of missing each other so far, but we're now getting one extra shift each. Six, four. Okay, that's good. We can move, use two shift to move that down to a four, four. Means we're gonna do D6 plus four damage. D6 plus three. Sorry, no, three plus four rather, so that's four, five, six, seven. But they are absorbing two with their low duck, so it's five points of damage, taking them down to 13. What have I done there? That's not right, is it? How much damage did I do in the first round? Wasn't it six, seven, eight, nine, ten? I did eight points of damage, and somehow I did 20 minus eight and got 18. So that should have been 12, and then we're doing an additional five, which I think should take me down to seven. Hopefully that's right or moderately close to being right. They're gonna attack back. Four, four, they've got three shift now, but I think even that is not gonna do the job for them. So we're gonna go on to round five. So far this Tomb Raider has proven delightfully incompetent. One, three, so we've now got four shift. So what can we shift this to? I think probably, can I shift it to a 4-4? Four, four? 
that's going to go one, two, three, four, and then up to a four, and I've got four shifts. That's all right, isn't it? Because I can shift that to a four and that to a four. Meaning once again, we are able to do our hue. I am glad I went for the hue. Ah, oh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Minus two is eight. So that is enough to take the Tomb Raider out. Brilliant. Oh, I like my new manoeuvre. That is fantastic. I shouldn't have got rid of that yet because we need to add on the XP. We're getting 70 XP taking us up to 1,142, I think. That's right, isn't it? I think that's right. And we are also going to be rolling on BST2. That is the body search table to five. On a shoulder strap is an old throwing knife, minus one. That's cool. Another throwing weapon. I quite like having the throwing axe, so a throwing knife is not as good, and minus one means it does one less damage because it's old. But it's a free attack at the start of a round of combat, and that is not to be sniffed at. Then we're going to roll BT2 plus two. This is the bag table two, the second of the bag tables. Oh, that's big, that could be good. Plus two means we're going up to max. This seems to be the valuables from a raid. Oh, brilliant, oh my goodness, look at all these jewels. This is, this is the mother load. D6 medium quality pearls. Oh, that's some good, I'm doing some good rolling here. Six pearls, taking me up to eight pearls. D3 plus one low quality rubies. So that's three low quality rubies. And D3 low quality emeralds, one. That's pretty decent though. That is a nice haul of stuff and some gold coins. My goodness, the Tomb Raider is well worth defeating. Two D6 gold coins. I don't know if you heard that, but that was my watering can getting blown around the garden in the windy conditions that are occurring around my house at the moment. What was that? Okay, right, I got distracted by that. 2d6 gold coins. Nine, nine gold coins. This has been very, very good. Nine gold coins, taking me up to 41 gold coins. So if we turn back to the entry for the mosaic tomb, I think there was something else there as well. Yeah, it says roll on CT3, and we need to work out the random door. Let's work out the random door first. So random exit, 3-3 three, three gives us archways. So that is good. And then CT3. Oh, it's the chest that the Tomb Raider was rooting around in. This has been a very, very good room. CT3 chest table, four. There is a small wooden case in the bottom. You flip it open and find a fine lock pick, plus three brackets three. I have never had lock picks before. This is exciting. So I don't know what those numbers mean. Does that mean three lock picks? I'm not really sure. I will find out when we are in a situation to pick some locks. That was a good room. I like that room. Big fan. Big fan of that room. Let's go on and see what else we're going to find. Six five. A massive room. Well, that's going to be the full width of our little space that we've got going on here. Not quite six wide, but the maximum it will allow. I'm not going to have any exits on either side. I don't know if there's a rule about only having one exit per wall. I'm not really sure. Let's roll and see how many exits we're going to have first. Two. So there's only one exit, so I don't, I don't need to know that right now. We're going to put the exit nice and square in the middle, I think. And that is a 25 square room, so it's still a standard size room. So let's roll again and see what it is. C3. 
63. What does that say? A Muratini shrine. A Muratini shrine. What's Muratini? Is that one of the gods? Oh, it is. It's one of the gods, Muratini the pulp. We have not come across them yet. There is a large statue of a beast with many animal faces, twisted muscles and torn flesh. This is a sacred place to Muratini. You may apply two different offerings correctly, each for one FP, with archways out. And that is a unique room. Mmm, so Muratini the pulp likes for offerings blood, which I have none of, meat, which I have none of, leather, I think I've got some leather, horn, dragon scales, rubies. Do I have any rubies? I do, I've got three low quality rubies. And because I'm able to use this shrine twice, I could gain four favour points here, I think, because each ruby will gain. Is it plus two? So is that these are everything is one and a ruby is one plus two. Could I gain six favour points for Muratini the pulp here? What's the benefit of Muratini? It reaches down and crosses your head with blood. This is if you gain the favour. The bloodied status no longer affects you. So I could do things that get me bloodied. I wouldn't get that status. That could be quite handy. So I'm just looking at the calling on favour bit. I'm a little confused here. Because that's its gift, what I just read out. And it says here, if you roll below one when calling on the favour of the god, they appear and grant a gift as well as the favour. So what's the favour? Right, I think I just need to pause and have a little read here. So you can call on the favour of any god once per level. When you successfully call for favour from a god, you remove all the ticks and you can't call the favour of the god until you've got a tick again. And if you gain their favour, you get to do one of these things. Heal all HP to your baseline. Explode an enemy of a level equal to or below yours. Gain one discipline or one precision for one dungeon level. Acquire an object needed for a task. Oh. So that body that was hung from the ceiling, I could have used favour to magically gain a hook on a long stick and I could have hooked them down and looted the body. Is that what that means? Let me know in the comments if you think that that is what it means. Find a working lever to open all portcullises in the room. Fix an item even without the needed parts. Remove the bloodied or soaked status. Plus three on your next loot roll. Plus three shift on your next attack roll. Wow, I should have looked at this sooner. That's awesome. Then there are certain ways that you are able to roll less than one. And if you roll less than one, not only do you gain one of those advantages, you also get the gift that they are able to grant. I see. OK, I understand that now. I think it's worth using up our rubies. Oh, that's what I was doing, wasn't I? I was trying to make sure. So that's, yeah, plus two. That must mean three, right? So it's the standard one plus two. So for my first offering to Muratini, I'm going to use one of my rubies. That will gain me three favour points. One, two, three. And then for my second offering, I'm going to use one of my other rubies to gain another three. That was very, very good. Good's the word, right? So that means I can now call on Muratini's favour. Um, I'm guaranteed to be able to get it because you just have to roll, is it less than or equal to a less than? So it's either guaranteed or very likely that I'll be able to get their favour and that will help me out in a sticky situation. That's really good. Okay, I'm just gonna make a note that I made two offerings. Fantastic. What a good room. 
Let's go on, shall we? So that was room seven. So we're going to go on into the next room. Here we go. One, four. So this is a corridor. How many doors off our corridor? A max number of doors. Oh, so one, four. Uh, yeah, so that's a straight up. Now I'm not going to have a, a door off this side because again, there's not really... I might just put a little kink in the corridor like that. How's that look? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we'll put a door up there. And we'll put a door on the end. Um, do you have to roll for anything in corridors? I can't remember. Yeah, you don't. So we're going to carry on um, over this way, I think. And we'll see what's over here. It's another corridor. Do I want another corridor? Not really. I don't want another corridor. Right. Six, two. So we've got sort of a long and uh, quite narrow room. So I suppose we will go down like that. Again, I don't personally think there's any point in having a room down here. So we'll block that off. Take that over here. Let's find out if we're going to have one or two doors. No doors, it's a dead end. Alrighty, that's fine. So this is room eight. It's another standard room. 42. 42, ancient effigy. A long time ago in this plain room, someone erected a grisly effigy to the god Maduva. You may make a correct offering to Maduva to gain one favour point, then roll on L, T, 2, R. We've got archways out and it is unique. So we're really making some time with these gods here. After three levels of very little god action, we are now godding it right up. So let's have a look at what Maduva can accept as an offering. Bone, ash, leather, teeth, fangs, wishbone, emerald. So again, all of a sudden, we've got a low quality emerald. We could use that and go straight up to three. Do you know what I think I might? I know I've got leather, I know I've got teeth, but I like the idea of using an emerald and just maxing out. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use our low quality emerald. We're gonna pop that next to the, uh, the whatever it is we've just found the grizzly effigy that would allow us to do uh, plus two so a standard favor point plus two for maduva another three brilliant and then it said roll on l t two r l two t r is the level two trap table and since we're in level three i find myself wondering if that is a mistake but that's what it says and given the amount of good luck we have had i think i should just go with it l2tr eight a large stone falls from above if you have the heavy mace you can smash it away otherwise lose d3 hp that's half of uh, d6 rolls so that's going to be half uh, is going to be one because it's rounded up. So we're losing one HP down to 38. Okay, so maybe we should push on and have one more room before we finish this video. Now you can finish a level really whenever you want. I think the guidance is that once your area is roughly 75% full, you can start thinking about finishing the level and declaring your next room to be the last one that leads down to the next level. And then you just mark off any existing doors that you haven't gone through as, you know, locked or um, uh, broken or whatever. But I think we will push on and explore this area out in one final video that might end up being quite short, but that's what I'm going to do. So let's have one more room for this video. 
So once again, I'm not going to have a door coming down this way. I don't think you can actually have a door on the on the side that your entrance is on. I might be wrong about that. And I can't be bothered to look. And a four gives us two, yeah, two exits. Uh, so three, so we'll have one exit here and one exit here. So what's this room going to be? 42, that feels like a number we just rolled. Is that the one we just rolled? Yeah, that's the Twisted Effigy room, and that is a unique room, so we have to re-roll that. 45 gives us the Smart Tomb. This chamber is lined with alcoves in which appear to be urns with nobles name plaques. Plaques, plaques. If you search them, roll on URL2, but then roll a D6. One to four, a patrol turns up. Roll on L4P. Archways, not unique. Okay, so we're definitely going to do that, aren't we? So this is a smart tomb. So we're going to roll on URL2. You know, some games would just have like a loot table or a search table. Toby thinks I'm going to have two urn loot tables, two table, a, a table loot table, a tea chest loot table, two sarcophagus tables, two secret hatch tables, and uh, pouches, some religious artifacts tables, a rubbish pile table, pouch tables, religious pouch tables, all sorts. But this is an urn. What have we got in the urns? We have got a purse. Inside is some jewellery worth 4d6 plus 3 30 gold coins. That is a haul. Oh, and that is a big roll as well. My goodness. So that's 10, 15, 21, 31, 41, 51 gold coins. Whoa, that is brilliant. That takes me up to 92 gold coins. I'm feeling quite wealthy at the moment. Now, are we going to have a patrol? No! No patrol! Uh, was there anything else for this room? I don't think there was. Let's just double check though. Nope, that's it. That's it for this room. So we just found a load of gold. Fantastic. So there you go. Bane has had a pretty good level there. A pretty good session. Uh, not much more to say. We'll finish this in a third part. We'll just explore a couple more rooms and uh, finish off the level. And then that'll be it for the time being before we take Bane out into the realm in a future series. But thank you very much for watching, folks. Hope you enjoyed this one. See you again soon. Bye for now.